And now it's my honor to introduce Dr. Greg Hipskin. Dr. Greg is a nationally recognized nuclear and behavioral neurologist who specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of traumatic and toxic brain injuries. Uh, Dr. Greg has published numerous articles in neurobehavioral medicine for ADHD, traumatic brain injury, and carbon monoxide poisoning. I was introduced to Greg's work uh, while treating suicidal veterans healing from traumatic uh, brain injury with comorbid post-traumatic stress disorder. Today, he's gonna to talk about transcranial LED light therapy for both brain healing and optimization for health and peak performance in gaming and for life. Dr. Greg. <clears throat> oh, well, great. It's, thank it's great to be here, uh, JD. Thank you for that um, introduction. Um, I didn't realize uh, that I had done so many things until you mentioned those. And uh, people are probably wondering, you know, what is a nuclear and behavioral neurologist? And I'll tell you exactly what that is. That is a neurologist that sees patients in his office with various brain disorders, tries to help them and gets confused and needs help. And so that happened in my career. And when, when I came across a difficult patient or someone I couldn't help or I couldn't figure out, I looked to do something unique at the time, which was in the 90s. I decided to add imaging to my practice. That is for those um, neurobehavioral patients that had uh, various brain conditions and I couldn't quite sort them out. I decided to perform functional imaging or molecular imaging. And that began the trail that I'm on today. And I'm happy to be here with you all today to uh, discuss some of the things I've done. Uh, it was, uh, Dr. Dra did uh, participate with us in the study that I published that I'm gonna talk about today and his help with that was most appreciated. I'm also uh, happy to be here today with the other uh, Summit, uh, Warrior Summit Foundation people uh, that are trying to make uh, progress with our struggles with the increase in veteran and, and teenage suicides we've seen here in the state of Colorado. And so it's, um, it's my belief that in the better all of us can understand how our brains work, the better able we'll be to take care of our uh, challenged and, and difficult patients. Um, so how did, how did we get here? Um, where did this all start, the idea of behavioral disorders and the brain? <clears throat> um, I think most of you will recognize Sigmund Freud uh, as a famous doctor from over a hundred years ago who worked with uh, transactional analysis and the interpretation of dreams and, and psychoanalysis. And one of the things that a lot of people don't know about Dr. Freud is that his basic training was actually in neurophysiology and neuroanatomy. <clears throat> and in fact, he was not a psychiatrist or a psychologist at all. He was a neurologist. And he took a divergent path from the standard neurologic practice of the day, and he was chided quite a bit by his colleagues. And uh, he informed them that, in fact, uh, he was on the right track and that, that someday, his path would cross with those of his neuro neurologic friends. And what did he mean by that? What he was talking about was the new paradigm of the mind is what the brain does. Uh, and this is a quote from Sigmund Freud from over a hundred years ago. The mind is basically a complex energy system, the structural in investigation of which is the proper province of psychology today. It's referred to psychiatry in those days is psychology. <clears throat> so basically, from a long time ago, uh, at least according to Freud, these various processes that we now refer to as mental health and neuroses and so forth, to, in his mind, was synonymous with brain health. And I myself have been practicing for many years and um, I'm fairly conversant with neuroanatomy, and I am yet to find uh, the anatomical location for the mental lobe of the brain. It just doesn't exist. Fortunately, uh, uh, Freud's uh, advice to uh, properly investigate the structure 
of, of the brain. Uh, in order to do that, we're fortunate that newer technology is allowing us to dive deeper into some of those basic brain processes which underlie mental disorders. <clears throat> so let's just talk briefly a little bit about molecular imaging and brain physiology. First of all, what is molecular imaging? Molecular imaging is a type of functional imaging and it stands in contrast to say CAT scans or MRIs. CAT scans and MRIs um, have a resolution uh, measured in the millimeters. They can get down structurally to anatomical structural uh, components that are tenths of millimeters in size. Um, molecular imaging takes that a thousand times deeper. We go on a deeper dive. We can measure biological processes in the brain that are occurring at, at the nanometer level, on the molecular level. Brain spec imaging is one such uh, modality. And <clears throat> spec imaging uh, is a type of nuclear imaging that is a serves as a biomarker for underlying brain physiology, metabolism, and activity. Um, it's very similar to PET imaging, which, but PET is more expensive and has more radiation. SPECT looks at cellular blood flow, brain cell blood flow, as an indicator of the metabolic status of brain cell function. This is critical um, because in the study I'm going to talk to you about, we had 12 veterans that had sustained uh, permanent brain damage, and we're going to see their functional scans or molecular scans, which were markedly abnormal, but their anatomical images were all normal. <clears throat> um, and in SPECT imaging, low brain blood flow cor correlates with low brain metabolism. One of the important things in this type of imaging, and one of the reasons I preferred SPECT over PET, is that the SPECT literature um, is more robust, and it also has uh, proprietary normative databases out there which can be utilized. And why is that important? It's important that when you do a brain scan, particularly a, a SPECT scan or a functional scan, even if you were to do a PET scan, uh, it's, if you see areas of low activity, it's important to know whether that at low activity is normally low or it's abnormally low. And the only way you can do that is if you have a normative database. The software that I work with at the Sarascan Corporation um, at the time had a very uh, well-established normative database so that when we were scanning individuals uh, and we would see low or high areas, we were actually able to comment on whether those were abnormally low or high. And because um, I have specialized in, in, in traumatic brain injury. I thought we would use that as a model for looking um, at the physiology of the brain and interventions with um, such things as light therapy and gaming, which is what we're going to talk about. So regarding traumatic brain injury, we know there's a silent epidemic going on in America. Uh, particularly with sports concussions uh, and the like. We also have our, our, our war veterans th that have come back with blast injuries. And we're now learning that, uh, that a, a traumatic brain injury is no longer viewed as an isolated event. Research at UCLA and others has shown that once you have a concussion, a neurometabolic cascade unfolds and results in a complex disease process that unfolds over time. Um, fortunately, 90% of mild traumatic brain injuries resolve within three to six months, but there are five to 10% in the miserable, miserable minority of millions of people sustaining concussions that go on to have chronic brain problems. And I see those in my practice. <clears throat> when this, pro when Traumatic brain injury is studied at the animal level. What we see in the brain tissue of, of uh, guinea pigs or, or rats that are sacrificed at the cellular level is we see evidence of neuroinflammation uh, of the brain cells and mitochondrial dysfunction. And as we'll see in a moment, that is of great import when it comes to light therapy. <clears throat> this next slide uh, is from an animal study, and I will simply have you uh, uh, 
address your attention to the red arrow, which is pointing to a structure at the microscopic level of a mitochondria. Now, one of the things about brain cells that's important to understand is our brains consume 20% of our en energy every day. Why is that? And, and, and the reason for that is if you think about it as a carbon-based animal structure, a, a human being or a mammal or any other animal in nature, we are all made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So how is it, and along with electrolytes and so forth, how is it that we can conduct electricity? Well, here's a thumbnail. In order to conduct electricity, a, any individual cell must have a charge across its membrane, a positive charge on one side, a negative charge on the other. How do you do that? You do that with the sodium potassium pump and the sodium potassium pump takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of ATP, you know, the energy molecule of all of our cells, adenosine triphosphate. Where is that generated from? Right here at the red arrow. So at the heart of all of this is the mitochondria churning out ATP, swirling that sodium potassium revolving drawer, creating a positive charge across the membrane, allowing this brain cell to conduct electrical impulses. But we have a problem, a serious problem. That mitochondria has been infiltrated from the, the results of a concussion that was applied with calcium. This is calcium staining and shows as part of the metabolic phenomenon that occur with even the mildest of concussions at some level you see uh, impairment of the ability of the mitochondria to generate ATP. This is at the cellular level, the, the fundamental reason why in thinking about our approach to doing a scientific study uh, to help traumatic brain injury, um, our intervention that we researched and we felt that we would choose was light therapy. <clears throat> light therapy, how can light therapy work? Well, uh, so this is a diagram of the mechanism of action of a process called photobiomodulation. Photo for the photons of light, bio indicating that it acts on a biological system and modulation uh, meaning that as a result of the intervention of the photons of light, there is change in that cell's metabolism. So in particular, what we're interested in with the brain is near infrared light. And there are numerous studies in animals and in humans that show that near infrared light delivered with either lasers or LEDs, uh, superluminous LEDs also can penetrate the skull. The near infrared frequency in the 810 to 850 nanometer range will penetrate the skull and will go down and impact on a what we call a, a chromophore, that is, a, a photoacceptor in the mitochondrial uh, called the number four complex. And that attracts this light, this photon, and it will kick off a nitric oxide molecule. In the process of kicking off the nitric oxide molecule, the mitochondria then will create more ATP. It will also release the nitric oxide which will cause a local vasodilatation for about four to five hours. And further, the nitric oxide has been shown in Nobel Prize winning experiments in, with regard to heart tissue. It serves as an intracellular signaling molecule to upregulate and downregulate genetic coding uh, for various healing substances uh, to be manufactured. And some of the, the general categories of things that have been found in the animal studies are uh, anti-inflammatories, uh, antioxidants such as glutathione, and growth factors such as BDNF and, and, and others have been shown to be produced as a result of the stimulation uh, of nitric oxide by near-infrared light. So we thought, okay, we've got this disease process involving the mitochondria. Let's see if we can go in and knock a few calciums off and let's let's see um, what we can do. And we did it, we ended up publishing this study uh, in the Journal of Photobiomodulation, Photomedicine and Laser Surgery. 
uh, pulsed transcran transcranial red and NIR light therapy using LEDs. We used LEDs, not lasers. Improved uh, cerebral blood flow and cognitive function in veterans with chronic traumatic brain injury with a case series of 12 individuals. So, <clears throat> so the background was, as I've discussed a little bit, was that photobiomodulation therapy is what we call it, uh, using LEDs has been shown to have positive effects on uh, brain physiology in individuals, uh, with animal and humans with traumatic brain injury. Um, a picture of the, a device sim very similar to the one we used is in, noted in the picture on the right. We had a cap that, that uh, surrounded the head along with a cap on top. Um, and the object of this uh, study was to explore what uh, applying this light therapy uh, with three different frequencies uh, across the brain would do. Now, there is some background on this. Um, this is one of many studies uh, with LEDs. Uh, this is by uh, Margaret Naser. Uh, and she developed a protocol using uh, a light cap, and she applied her dose of light three times a week for six weeks. And so we tried to duplicate the exact same study as Dr. Naser from Harvard. And so uh, our methods were we had 12 symptomatic military veterans that were diagnosed with chronic TBI. They had to have it for more than 18 months because we wanted to make sure that they uh, wouldn't uh, achieve any natural healing during the time of therapy that they might not have otherwise healed. And then we had two neoprene pads that were Velcroed together. And to make a long story short, the power density, which is basically your dose of light, was 6.4 milliwatts per square centimeter. We did applied the device for 20 minutes, three times a week for six weeks. My British editors like the word thrice, as do I, it saved my word count. So three times a week for six weeks. And the outcomes measured included standard neuropsychological and psychiatric test scores and qualitative and quantitative spec measures of regional cerebral blood flow. So we wanted to see if, first of all, we could help these veterans, if we could help them feel better, uh, think better, feel better, be less depressed, less anxious, more cognitive alert. And we wanted to also uh, duplicate the previous Harvard study and actually measure brain blood flow as an indicator of underlying metabolism. And we wanted to do a baseline brain spec scans and, and spec scans following the procedure. Um, today, this device, a, a very similar markup of it, it's called the head cap light system uh, that is available for anybody that has, uh, that's interested in this type of intervention for any of their patients that either have mild TBI or have uh, anxious or depressive symptomatology. <clears throat> um, so um, here are our results, and I think, you know, your eye is drawn immediately to the remarkable images to the right, um, which, uh, let's just look at those. Let's look at the pretreatment scans, and this these images represent the blood flow pattern on the cortex, on the outer cortex of the brain. This is a right lateral view of, of a patient before treatment, and then the inferior uh, image, uh, is a superior view of that same individual. And the color scale we're used here is the one on the right in which gray represents normal brain blood flow and green would represent two standard deviations lower than that normative database. Remember I told you, you can scan somebody's brain and find some low areas, but uh, if they're low, are they actually statistically low or do this kind of look low or it's kind of like, look at it with your thumb and say, I think maybe it's low. Blue light blue is three three standard deviations, dark blue is four. So this individual had a fair amount of brain injury, uh, low metabolic activity of his cortical blood flow. Uh, and I want to remind you that this individual, as all of the individuals did, had a normal brain CT scan. Many of them had normal brain MRI scans. So again, the difference between structural imaging, going to the millimeter level versus molecular imaging, getting down and looking at the nanometer level, the cellular level. That's 
that's what you need to do. And look at the remarkable change in this individual following 18 treatments uh, in his the blood flow on the surface of his brain. This is one individual. Uh, we had similar results, uh, some more, some less. Uh, and over on the left is the analysis that, that it says eight out of 12 increased their brain blood flow. Technically 10 did, but uh, two of the 12 only increased 5%, where most of them averaged 60%. So we they were kind of on the borderline. But, but between 8 and 10 out of 12 showed increased blood flow. Um, when we took that group that had uh, uh, low blood flow initially and, and increased their blood flow and then compared their pre and post brain blood flows, our statistical difference was positive at the P0.007 level, a, a remarkable uh, in, improvement. Um, we also did, in addition to the comparison to the normative database, we also did quantitative measurement of individual gamma rays. You have to understand this, they're on the order of 5 million gamma rays that come out with each study. And we measured the total counts in 130 different regions, compared them pre and post, and there was also statistical improvement uh, in the brain blood flow. So pretty remarkable uh, improvement on the blood flow on the surface of the brain. <clears throat> how did they do? Uh, what, how did they feel? What were the, what, how did their thinking and all the other uh, difficulties they had, their, their problems with attention, focus, and concentration? <clears throat> this is the neuropsychological data. They completed a complete battery of 15 neuropsychological tests here on the left column. And these were their raw, or their scores, their T-score actually. And then this is their measurement following treatment on the right. And it turns out, uh, without going into great detail, that, it, that as a group of 12, as a group, they improved on 14 out of 15 subscales of executive function, which is phenomenal. And with regard to gaming and improving processing speed, um, this was actually the most significant change. Uh, there was a change at the positive at the P uh, less than 0 0.009 level in their ability to think quickly. So uh, re remarkable improvement. Uh, most individuals felt better. They could think better. And many of them returned to work and employment, whereas they were unable to hold a job and so forth. Um, and one of the things we also know about traumatic brain injury is that it is associated with depression. It's not uncommon uh, for TBI individuals to suffer from depression. And it's also not uncommon for them to, to suffer from PTSD. Uh, I'm focusing on the depression today because of the, the nature of the summit meeting. But um, so we tested them uh, at baseline for symptoms of depression and anxiety. And, uh, and I will have you focus, this is somewhat of a complicated slide, but basically um, the issues are, the various symptoms are at the bottom of the slide. Uh, depression is about the fifth one over and red bars represent prior to, uh, to treatment and the blue bar post-treatment. And uh, this was a Likert scale of zero to five. And you can see that sig there were significant reductions in de uh, depression, irritability, anxiety, and anhedonia. Uh, I think our anxiety redu symptom reduction was fairly, fairly marked. So we had data showing there was improvement in psychiatric symptoms. Um, and again, uh, this was partly a result of the improvement in the blood flow on the cortex. Now, what does the cortex of the brain and the, in, in humans, what is its relationship to anxiety and depression in terms of functional neuroanatomy? Well, it turns out, and we'll see in the next slide, um, Let's look at the image. Uh, what is the neurophysiology of depression? Subcortical. 
Well, in addition to the cortex, we also scanned the gray matter on the inside of the brain uh, in the limbic system. And the limbic system is in this slide on the right characterized by the basal ganglia and the thalami, which are hooked up and connected via the fornix to the cortex. And this is our emotional regulation center. This is a baseline pre-light therapy scan. And you can see the whole cortical rim, this is green, it's, it's a little bit low. Yellow is normal on this scale. So there's not a lot of yellow out here. And we're seeing a fair amount of, look at the, this little dent here uh, compared to this side. Uh, so there are definitely lower than average blood flow, but what is remarkable, what stands out is the marked increase in the activity of the limbic system. And most of these individuals, as I mentioned, were suffering from anxiety or PTSD or depression or both. Um, what do we know about the neurophysiology? I made a, a crude Picasso over here, which basically shows the general functional neuroanatomical cir circuitry. This represents the frontal lobe here. And, and in the center, we have the limbic system. The main job of our cortex is to inhibit our emotions. I mean, if you think about it, that's what separates man <clears throat> from animal, um, our ability to control our emotions, theoretically. Uh, that's what's supposed to happen. And when you have an injury to the cortex such that the brain cells aren't working normally, you lose the inhibition of the emotional centers such that it results in an image like this on the on the right. This would be a phenomenon called disinhibition. Um, the inhibition from our emotion, emotional control occurred because of lack of cortical uh, control. Um, <clears throat> this is pre-light therapy. What happened to the same individual after six weeks of light therapy? Boom, this. Increased brain cell activity, increased met metabolism, increased brain blood flow on the cortical rim around the outside. And take a look at the emotional centers. A reciprocal decrease in their activity, a normalization of the blood flow in the structures that control anxiety and depression. And so this was not only seen clinically, in terms of their neuropsychological and psychiatric testing, but this was observed on the images. Again, the diagram showing, uh, representing again, when you have increased frontal lobe activity, you have increased inhibition on the limbic system and therefore uh, more of, of a regulated uh, emotional system. Um, there's been a lot of work on this. Um, uh, recently, well, that's not been 10 years now, uh, some of this neuroanatomy of mood and anxiety disorders, has, has, they've been peeling the onion on this. And again, there's an article, there are many of them on this. I have, I have about 12 articles, but this is one that I thought was particularly good by Marchand in 2010, uh, reviewing the key research uh, of the functional conductivity studies on mood and anxiety relating to, if you'll see your cortico, basal ganglia circuitry, connection between the cortex and the basal ganglia, which are also part of the limbic system. Um, there are other articles uh, that deal directly with depression and light therapy. Uh, our depressive symptomatology uh, was associated with traumatic brain injury, but there are also uh, studies using light therapy for non-traumatic depression uh, by these authors. Um, and uh, uh, Schiffer was one of the first to do it in 2009, and then most recently, uh, 2010. So anyway, there are there is research being done on this. I'm not the only one out there doing this. This is work that's going on um, in labs all across the world right now with light therapy. Um, so our conclusion was simply that the uh, pulsed uh, transcranial, the small t is for transcranial, 
photobiomodulation using LEDs. There are others that are big on lasers. We were able to show, show it with LEDs, shows promise in improving cognitive function and cortical regional blood flow several years after traumatic brain injury. Larger control studies are indicated. We also showed improvement in symptoms of anxiety and depression, which were associated with normalization of brain metabolism in the limbic system, as I just described. So this is an example of, you know, the mind is what the brain does. So the brain processes of, uh, of lack of executive function, cognitive uh, injury, uh, emotional dysregulation are all abnormalities of brain metabolism, and they can be addressed with, with modern and new novel interventions such as light therapy. <clears throat> so now that you're schooled up, um, for the gamers here at, in, uh, in the crowd, um, what is going on in the gaming industry with regard to what we know about how gaming can be therapeutic uh, and help individuals with both their cognitive functioning as well as their emotional regulation. Um, I, I would like to thank members of this summit that send me some articles to update me on this, but I found them very interesting. This is an article uh, that was published uh, that in PLOS One <clears throat> indicating anatomic changes, actual thickening of the gray matter in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex uh, and another area of the uh, cortex. Uh, so I think the dorsolateral prefrontal is, uh, is a, it's of, of a great significance because that is one of the main inhibitory routes uh, to our emotional regulation center. Um, in fact, it's the very last area of the brain to finish its myelinization in the developing brain and doesn't finish uh, making its connections till age 25 in males, which is why if you're a guy, you won't be able to rent a car until you're 25. It seems how the car rental companies seem to know about this. So uh, at any rate, from what we've learned, what would be the significance of increasing your cortical brain activity? Well, you, would, you might think that it might have some effect on inhibiting and helping control uh, problems and symptoms of depression and our anxiety. And I believe those studies are ongoing. Um, <clears throat> what else have we learned in the gaming crowd? Well, on the right here, we see a study that was done using functional MRI during the active process of gaming, choosing an attack or defense strategy. And we see various areas of the cortex lighting up with, with the activity of gaming, attacking or defending. And again, from what we've learned, this would be therapeutic, uh, would it not? Both, from, both in terms of improving your cognitive functioning, your executive function, your processing speed, but also of controlling, helping control uh, your emotional regulation. On the left, we have another uh, study that was similar, looking at functional activity of the brain, showing increases in activity in the right and left hippocampus. Uh, with gaming activity. What does the hippocampus do? That's our memory center. So it's also on the cortex and has some role. Uh, parts of the hippocampus do connect to the limbic system. So there is some involvement, we know neuroanatomically of the hippocampus to the limbic system, such that changes there would be of theoretical value uh, to controlling emotions and helping perhaps with individual with depression. Um, this is a slide from one of the studies basically showing the increase in the, in the number of scientific studies that have occurred from, from 2008 where we had 65 to 2016 where we had 380. And I don't have the latest, but I'm, I'm going to be guessing it's in the thousands in which we have uh, evidence of studies going on looking at the neural basis of video gaming. What what circuits, which, which, connect, which connectomes, which circuits uh, are activated uh, during the gaming process. And it seems to be uh, exerting a therapeutic effect on individuals. Uh, don't be overwhelmed by this slide. Basically, it's a summary of some of those studies on the right. The, the far right column 
lists all the different brain areas that are activated with gaming. And you can see there's a lot of studies and a lot of areas of the brain are, are showing up to be positively affected. So this trend of the three or four I've showed is being repeated over and over. <clears throat> so to circle back to the beginning with our buddy, Dr. Freud, have our paths finally crossed? In other words, um, is, is the mind uh, what the brain does? Is mental activity a function of the brain? And I would say, I hope that you've picked up that, that we think it is. And in fact, uh, on the right here is a list of brain disorders compiled by the world's greatest expert on light therapy. That's Dr. Michael Hamblin, formerly of Harvard and editor-in-chief of the Journal of Photobiomodulation that based on all of the animal studies and the human studies, this is a list of various brain disorders that might be amenable to light therapy. And I think of note is the, the headline, the title of this group is brain disorder. And then underneath it, we have as divisions, we have traumatic brain disorders such as stroke and, and traumatic brain injury and coma birth trauma and, and chemo brain are some typical examples of traumatic brain disorders. We have progressive or neurodegenerative brain disorders, the dementias, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, CTE, the development of tau encephalopathy and, and our football players, um, prion disease. And then you'll notice that psychiatric is listed as a subdivision of brain disorders. So Psych, what traditionally we call mental disorders is grouped under brain disorder. And of course, of these, we see de depression, including bipolar, bipolar uh, psychosis, PTSD, anxiety, addictive disorders. And finally, a fourth category of neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, such as uh, that are, have a genetic uh, background in some cases, such as ADHD, um, and, and autism. So there have either been animal or human studies demonstrating efficacy or based on the known pathophysiology of those brain disorders and probably mitochondrial dysfunction, they might be amenable to treatment with uh, light therapy. So I would submit today in 2021 that, that uh, the mind is meeting the brain uh, mental health is meeting the brain as the source of the disorder. And the more we investigate uh, the metabolic activity of the brain, uh, the better able we'll be to come up with treatments that are more targeted, uh, not just you know, Band-Aids. So um, uh, I thank you very much for your time today. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share this information with you. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me at my email list today. Uh, thank you. Thanks again. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Greg. And uh, we do have some questions uh, from the audience. Um, okay. First oh, we question. Do we have an audience today? We have the audience. Yeah. The first question, um, you know, that we got from them was, you know, on a way to integrate sort of gaming with the photobiomodulation. And is that something that you would do sort of concurrently or would you use the photobiomodulation as a recovery? Um, you cited some of the literature related to photobiomodulation increasing processing speed. Um, just do you have any preliminary thoughts related to sort of related to that? So concurrent photobiomodulation with gameplay or post gameplay or pre gameplay? Um, in terms of its impact on performance? Well, that's a, first of all, a very good question. And I, I don't have a direct answer for it, but it's simply because I am not personally aware of any information in that regard. I, I will tell you, uh, it's been proposed to me uh, by, uh, by a mutual friend uh, uh, and colleague that, um, <laughs> that a device which applied transcranial light therapy with a light cap and the, uh, the goggles of the virtual reality, that there, 
if they could fit, there wouldn't be any proscription against doing them simultaneously. Um, I've had the same question come up with regard to the use of light therapy and hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which, by the way, is is good intervention for some conditions. Um, in the case of hyperbaric oxygen therapy, I recommended the light therapy be done before the uh, hyperbaric dive. But in the case of gaming, I, I, I'm not sure it matters. Uh, that would be a good study uh, to do them simultaneously and then to do one before the other one. Uh, that is the gaming and then the light therapy and then light therapy and then gaming and then one that did both and then a group that did either one. Um, that would make a good study. I don't know the answer offhand. Yeah, and it's also, I found it fascinating, your sort of discussion in gaming with the neurocircuitry, right? Because we're seeing preliminary, I, I think I sent you some studies, sort of preliminary um, epidemiological data that gamers tended to be more resilient during the COVID quarantines. Um, and so it's just interesting as you sort of describe that, you know, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortical activation component of gaming and, and its effect on even sort of maybe promoting sort of resiliency and well-being through these uh, particularly difficult times. Well, and, and, and you know what, I can give you a meta, and, and that does make sense to me because what happens if you have anxiety and depression? What happens to your cortisol levels? <clears throat> they, go, they go up, you feel stress more. One of the other functions that we didn't talk about of, of the cerebral cortex is filtering out extraneous and or excessive environmental stimuli. And so when you lose your cortex, not only do you disinhibit your, your mood regulation, but you also lack lose your filter so that you feel things more deeply and you feel more stress. Stress or anxiety. When you have more anxiety, you'll feel more stress. Stress increases your cortisol cortisol decreases your immune response. So you could definitely make the, the case that gaming during COVID would be in, in some ways partially protective, at least from a functional neuroanatomical and physiological basis that I'm aware of. Right, right, exactly. Very good. Well, we have a lot of work to do, Dr. Greg. We have a lot of work to do going forward. We thank you uh, for your Thanks time you. and for this information. Uh, when where is where is the best uh, place for folks to to reach you? Is that at that your hippie doc email? Yeah. Yes, that yeah. would be fine. At, at the hippie doc forty seven at gmail, I would be happy to answer questions or give more information uh, about light therapy uh, for anyone that would be interested in that. Okay, very good. Well, thank you so much, and this is gonna uh, this is gonna end uh, the session for today, Dr. Greg. Uh, it's been our honor and, and pleasure. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me, JD. Thank you.